and with the forces of our coalition partners, the United States has moved under the code name Operation Desert Storm to enforce the mandates of the United Nations Security Council. As of 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Operation Desert Storm forces were engaging targets in Kuwait and Iraq. President Bush will address the nation at 9 o'clock p.m. tonight from the Oval Office. I'll try to get you more as soon as we can. Thank you very much. Marlon Fitzwater, the White House spokesman, not taking any questions. That was about an hour and 20 minutes ago in the White House, the official announcement coming from Mr. Fitzwater that the war in the Persian Gulf had in fact begun. On the line with me at the White House right now, uh, CBS News reporter Randall Pinkston, and uh, he has in fact been talking to Marlon Fitzwater. Randall, what's the latest over there? Uh, Fitzwater gave us a briefing in his office on uh, the hours leading up to the attack, uh, not giving the exact date of President Bush's decision uh, to go to war, but saying that it occurred at least two days ago. Also indicating that even though the deadline expired last night at midnight, uh, right up until the moment of the attack, had Saddam Hussein indicated some massive and rapid uh, movement out of Kuwait, uh, that the, uh, de the decision to attack could have been reversed. However, we know that instead of showing some signs of coming out, uh, Saddam Hussein uh, dug himself in even deeper. We have heard reports of uh, the deployment of additional forces, and so the, uh, the attack was ordered. Um, one concern for the president in these final moments was the presence of American reporters. Uh, as late as, as early, rather, as uh, January 10th, President Bush noticed on TV, a number of American reporters and technicians were still present in Baghdad. He spoke to Fitzwater, asked him whether he had notified them, warned them. Uh, on the 10th, at his regular briefing, uh, Fitzwater did that, told all the reporters in the room that uh, all Americans all, and anyone else was advised to leave Baghdad. He repeated that warning on the 14th, and the president continued to notice um, reporters two days ago in, in Baghdad, which would have been the 14th. And so today, Marlon Fitzwater did something extraordinary. He released a letter from Fitzwater to reporters telling them to get out because the possibility of war was there at any moment. Fitzwater also spoke to executives of news organizations as recently as this afternoon. One of those organizations indicated they would be flying their crews out tomorrow via charter plane. Fitzwater told them perhaps they should consider driving. Of course, um, Fitzwater knew at that point uh, that the attack was imminent and um, as you may have seen yourself Rob and everyone in America a number of Americans are still in Baghdad uh, the hotels where they are as far as we know now uh, have not been uh, bombed uh, they're they safe uh, but uh, who knows uh, which way this conflict will go um, Fitzwater made an interesting comment that the uh, the attack is not an ending it's a beginning and there will be many long days ahead America at war so Randall Pinkston at the White House, Marlon Fitzwater, giving you at least somewhat of a foreshadow that this is going to go on for some time. Yes. Um, no, the president himself, as of 7.15, had not received a uh, report back from the Pentagon, at least not a written report that Fitzwater was aware of. We, we are told that after his speech tonight, President Bush possibly will be going to the Pentagon. Of course, uh, he is in touch with uh, Defense Secretary Cheney, and General Powell of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and uh, in turn, uh, General Schwarzkopf, the American commander in the, in the desert. So uh, the reports are coming in, uh, as you have indicated, uh, and as Fitzwater indicated to us, at this point, everything appears to be uh, g going according to plan. Uh, President Bush left the uh, Oval Office shortly before 6 o'clock. Fitzwater believes he went over to the residence for a quick uh, meal, uh, the president returned to the Oval Office and between the hours of 6 and 7 was watching newscasts while he made phone calls to some world leaders and also to congressional leaders. Uh, House Speaker Foley, uh, Senate Majority Leader Mitchell, uh, Senate Minority Leader Dole, and House Minority Leader Michael. Uh, we know that those leaders were contacted. We do not know uh, the names of the foreign leaders that the president called. And shortly after 6.30, one of the uh, networks um, began reporting the sighting of what appeared to be anti-aircraft fire or, or rockets going off and, and the sounds of explosions. And the president turned to Fitzwater and said something to the effect of uh, just about on schedule. So uh, the president was watching, um, of course, knew that this was going to happen. And uh, so far, from the American point of view at least, uh, it appears to be going according to plan.
Rob. Let us uh, recap briefly. Uh, Marlon Fitzwater confirming some of the reports from the, uh, the Pentagon that things are going very positively. Uh, there is one report from CNN that there have been no casualties so far. Nobody else has confirmed that as of this moment. Randall Pinkston at the White House joining me. Uh, Randall, very briefly, security is very tight there very tight. Um, and also demonstrators uh, have begun to return to the White House. As you know, Rob, in the past few days, uh, several hundred and 1.5 thousand anti-war protesters uh, gathered in front of the White House for a candlelight vigil. Uh, last night, they were beating drums uh, through the passage of the deadline. The rains apparently drove most of those protesters away, but when the news reports began coming out uh, shortly after 6.30 tonight that the nation had indeed uh, launched Operation uh, Desert Storm. Uh, the protesters returned. Uh, Secret Service police, uniformed officers are blanketing the place. You cannot walk in front of the White House without uh, special credentials. You have to walk on the opposite side of the street. Uh, the streets have Randall, I'm going to have yet. to interrupt you here. We're going to have to go back to New York. Randall Pinkston at the White House. Again, President Bush to address the nation from the Oval Office in just about 30 minutes. This is Rob Armstrong in Washington, and now back to Frank Setapani in New York. And we have a report uh, via Baghdad radio that wave after wave of U.S. warplanes has uh, flown over the Iraqi capital tonight. However, we do not have that confirmed. That is just what Iraqi radio is saying, and uh, we don't know whether it's uh, an actual fact or for the benefit of uh, Iraq's uh, Arab supporters. Uh, this is CBS News continuing coverage of the outbreak of hostilities in the Persian Gulf. Our coverage now will pause for two minutes. This is the CBS Radio Network. The News Watch never stops. The streets of the Motor City gauging reaction right now to the reports that you've been hearing live on the CBS Radio Network. Cliff Russell is in the Wayne State University area. Greg Bowman is at the North American International Auto Show. Gary Baumgarten talking with members of the Arab and Chaldean communities. And WWJ's Roberta Decina was at the auto show when the news broke. She's in our studios live now. Roberta, what were they telling you, the people that you spoke with? Well, I'll tell you, Paul, at the auto show, it was uh, chilling to see the effect that the news, this news had on the huge crowd that, that had gathered around our speakers, hanging on to every word about this new war. They just, their eyes were glued to the speakers, watching the radio. People were visibly shaken. Some little children in the crowd seemed very scared. Uh, some women were crying. A lot of people just stood there with a terribly troubled expression on their faces not knowing where this new war will take us, how many lives it will take, and how and when it will end. Reporting live, Roberta Jacena, WWJ News Radio 95. This is WWJ Detroit. The time is 8.30. Let's get a traffic update from Rick DeMint. Well, right now, traffic moving along well in the uh, area on the freeways and surface streets. However, things are very slick out there and uh, travel moving along at near posted speeds. Right now, no major problems to pass along at this time. Rick DeMint, WWJ Traffic. Breezy and cold. We now resume our CBS News coverage of the Persian Gulf conflict. This is News Radio 95 WWJ. This is CBS News continuing coverage of the outbreak of hostilities in the Persian Gulf. I'm Frank Setapani in New York, along with CBS News correspondent Doug Poling and Ben Works, our CBS News military analyst. Uh, about 90 minutes ago, actually a little bit less than that, the White House announced that the United States had launched air attacks against Iraq and against Iraqi positions in Kuwait. Uh, the uh, British, according to a report from London, have also been involved in this. We do not know whether uh, any other Allied forces at this point are involved in the air war that has begun. There is no indication at this point of any combat on the ground. And there is also no indication at this point that uh, any U.S. forces on the ground in Saudi Arabia have come under attack. President Bush is expected to make uh, a statement to the nation uh, less than 30 minutes from now. He's due to go on the air at 9 p.m. Eastern Time to be followed about 30 minutes after that by Defense Secretary Cheney. And uh, additional briefings are anticipated uh, during the course of the evening. Uh, there has been a, a report from Baghdad that uh, the uh, attack is massive, but uh, at this point we really have not been able to confirm the exact extent of this. Uh, ben Works, uh, you've been following these developments with particular attention to what uh, I Iraq has done. Uh, ben Works is our CBS News military expert. Uh, ben, uh, what are the implications uh, of this uh, apparent lack of any response by the Iraqi forces? 
All right. Well, I do believe we will still hear something later on about some response, but I believe it will come primarily from the front lines and in the form of artillery fire. We are now two hours into the aerial campaign against Saddam, and we should now have his air force substantially scrubbed out of the sky. His airfields are starting to be destroyed, and the Scud missiles, which have a six-hour, a six-minute flight time have not yet landed and it's now two hours into the campaign. The window is very rapidly closing on Saddam's ability to strike long distances outside his borders. I remind the, our listeners that we have AWACS long distance aerial control planes with radars covering any flights coming out of Iraq long before they can get anywhere near a border. The ability even to get a random a kamikaze-style fighter plane across Iraq's borders into anywhere else is extremely remote by this stage because we have our air aerial fighters in, and they're just not going to get anywhere. Uh, ben, uh, CBS News reporter Scott Pelly is in the war zone. He is in Dahran. He is broadcasting this evening from a basement uh, in a building in Dahran. And uh, moments ago, he uh, spoke with CBS News correspondent Dan Rather in New York about an air raid alert in Dahran, which is a Saudi city which is directly on the Persian Gulf. And, and here's what he had to say. At this moment, there is an air raid alert. We are told here in Dahran by U.S. military officials that it is a Scud missile alert. Apparently, there has been at least a scare. We are not sure if it has been concert, uh, confirmed, I should say, at this point. That Scud missiles are inbound to our location here in Dharan. Dharan is a city on the Persian Gulf. It is the center of the oil industry here in Saudi Arabia and also the center of a very large military concentration, both British forces, American forces, and Saudi Arabian forces. I am reporting to you from the basement of a building here in Dharan. We are told once again by military officials that this is a Scud air raid alert. That was CBS News reporter Scott Pelley in Dahran. Uh, CBS News correspondent Doug Poling recently spent uh, seven weeks in Saudi Arabia and the Persian Gulf. Doug, uh, uh, what more light can you shed uh, beyond what Scott has just said? Well, I know exactly what Scott is going through, Frank, because we had a number of those Scud missile alerts while I am there. And I must stress that they are alerts. Uh, there are indications that they, uh, that they are, are going to try to fire those. And, of course, we know our, our reconnaissance is so sophisticated. We know when they're trying to fuel those missiles and get them off the ground. They are scary because they can carry chemical weapons and they can carry other types of uh, weaponry as well. But the uh, the scuds are not are not invincible by any means. They are notoriously inaccurate and uh, they don't have a range that is uh, terribly uh, uh, great. Uh, it depends, of course, on where they're fired from. But the range we think is less than 200 miles. It's scary, and I know what Scott is going through if they're trying to get them off the ground. But Ben Works, I believe you told me not long ago that the Scuds may, in fact, already be out of action for all practicality. I would assume that we have already hit most of the known Scud sites. Again, as you say, the moment the Iraqis try to load fuel into the Scuds, we tend to notice this with our aerial reconnaissance imagery. I will also say that on the off chance that a preloaded Scud was so well hidden that we didn't know about it, we do have two remaining responses with our anti-aircraft missiles, the Patriots and Hawks. Both are capable of intercepting a Scud in flight. And we just received word from uh, David Martin, our Pentagon correspondent, that we know of no attacks on Saudi Arabian oil fields yet. And, of course, we haven't heard anything from any source. We have heard that the Americans, and maybe even the British, but certainly the Americans, have uh, attacked some of the oil fields in Iraq. So far, and I think it's important to stress this, so far... The only um, action that we know of is in uh, Iraq and around Baghdad, and there is no counterattack yet that we know of by the uh, Iraqis, either on Saudi Arabia or on Israel or, or any other um, uh, place outside of, uh, outside of Iraq. And I also don't know exactly, we haven't heard much about what's going on in Kuwait. I think uh, the president said, or the, uh, his press secretary said earlier, that there is some kind of action taking place in Kuwait, but details have been extremely sketchy. 
We have absolutely no information of, of any specific nature on that. Uh, we are about to get more information on the military activity in the Persian Gulf from CBS News correspondent Dan Raviv, who is standing by in London. And uh, Dan, uh, I, at this point, I, I think that uh, we might have some questions for you from CBS News uh, military analyst Ben Works, who was with us in New York. So uh, at some point he might uh, jump in with a question, but uh, please go ahead with uh, the latest information you have. Well, Frank, as Benjamin Works was suggesting just a few moments ago, one of the key early targets would be the Iraqi Air Force bases to make them unusable if possible. The question is whether the Allied aircraft, especially the U.S. Air Force planes, could hit the Iraqi aircraft on the ground, something akin to what the Israelis managed to do to most of their Arab enemies at the outbreak of the Six-Day War in 1967. But the British Air Force, the Royal Air Force, would have a key role in this and, according to the British, has been taking an active part in doing just that. These are British Tornado GR-1 fighter bombers based in Bahrain as well as elsewhere, only 45 of them. But Mark Leidy, who is the BBC's defense correspondent, is in Saudi Arabia and reports that the Tornadoes, not a lot of them, but they've had quite a role tonight. They have a role out of proportion to their numbers because of the type of aircraft they are. The Tornado Strike Bomber is an all-weather night attack aircraft which is, which is partly designed to destroy runways and that's one of the most important targets in these first few critical hours. What it's got, it's got an, a bomb on it called the JP-233 which sends out over 200 munitions as they, as they zip low level across an airfield, maybe at uh, 50 or 60 feet then rising to 200 to drop the bomb. They contain runway cratering munitions. They um, parachute out and then bury themselves deep into a runway and crater it. Beside them are anti-personnel uh, munitions which are going off uh, one by one very quickly and then other time delay ones which will be going off every few minutes to prevent the runway being repaired. That's the kind of technology which is being used in these first few hours. Now those tornadoes are one of some of the best airplanes that we've got um, for this whole process and they will have been involved immediately. A British point of view there from Mark Lady, the BBC defense correspondent in Saudi Arabia. Frank? I... Uh, Dan, Ben Works is standing by with a question for you. Yes, I understand. The munitions, as, as just described, are uh, standard throughout the NATO air forces in that the British are carrying these, the Americans are carrying these, and our allied air forces will also be carrying these and going after each uh, of the approximately 50 known and identified Iraqi air bases about at the same time. Isn't that correct? Yes, Ben, and it's a question of how the targets were divided up. This was one of the most closely kept secrets in the run-up to turning Operation Desert Shield into Operation Desert Storm, this offensive phase that just began in the past few hours. Uh, the British earlier in the day were not willing to say exactly what their role would be, but out in the field, the Royal Air Force always made it clear it would be gunning for those Iraqi Air Force bases. As we heard the BBC's Mark Lady report, these little bomblets burying themselves in the runways at the Iraqi air bases, making the air bases unusable, even if the Iraqi planes managed to survive. And this is, uh, uh, that was Dan Raviv reporting to us from London. Uh, this is CBS News coverage of the outbreak of hostilities in the Persian Gulf. Let's pause now, 10 seconds, for our stations to identify themselves. This is CBS News. All not engaged. This conflict started August 2nd, when the dictator of Iraq invaded a small and helpless neighbor. Kuwait, a member of the Arab League and a member of the United Nations, was crushed. Its people brutalized. Five months ago, Saddam Hussein started this cruel war against Kuwait. Tonight, the battle has been joined. This military action, taken in accord with United Nations resolutions and with the consent of the United States Congress, follows months of constant and virtually endless diplomatic, diplomatic activity on the part of the United Nations, the United States, and many, many other countries. Arab leaders sought what became known as an Arab solution, only to conclude that Saddam Hussein was unwilling to leave Kuwait. Others traveled to Baghdad in a variety of efforts to restore peace and justice. Our Secretary of State, James Baker, held an historic meeting in Geneva, only to be totally rebuffed. This past weekend, in a last-ditch effort the Secretary General of the United Nations went to the Middle East with peace in his heart. 
his second such mission. And he came back from Baghdad with no progress at all in getting Saddam Hussein to withdraw from Kuwait. Now, the 28 countries with forces in the Gulf area have exhausted all reasonable efforts to reach a peaceful resolution, have no choice but to drive Saddam from Kuwait by force. We will not fail. As I report to you, air attacks are underway against military targets in Iraq. We are determined to knock out Saddam Hussein's nuclear bomb potential. We will also destroy his chemical weapons facilities. Much of Saddam's artillery and tanks will be destroyed. Our operations are designed to best protect the lives of all the coalition forces by targeting Saddam's vast military arsenal. Initial reports from General Schwarzkopf are that our operations are proceeding according to plan. Our objectives are clear. Saddam Hussein's forces will leave Kuwait. The legitimate government of Kuwait will be restored to its rightful place. And Kuwait will once again be free. Iraq will eventually comply with all relevant United Nations resolutions. And then, when peace is restored, it is our hope that Iraq will live as a peaceful and cooperative member of the family of nations, thus enhancing the security and stability of the Gulf. Some may ask, why act now? Why not wait? The answer is clear. The world could wait no longer. Sanctions, though having some effect, showed no signs of accomplishing their objective. Sanctions were tried for well over five months, and we and our allies concluded that sanctions alone would not force Saddam from Kuwait. While the world waited, Saddam Hussein systematically raped, pillaged, and plundered a tiny nation. No threat to his own. He subjected the people of Kuwait to unspeakable atrocities. And among those maimed and murdered, innocent children. While the world waited, Saddam sought to add to the chemical weapons arsenal he now possesses an infinitely more dangerous weapon of mass destruction, a nuclear weapon. And while the world waited, while the world talked peace and withdrawal, Saddam Hussein dug in and moved massive forces into Kuwait. While the world waited, while Saddam stalled, more damage was being done to the fragile economies of the third world, the emerging democracies of Eastern Europe, to the entire world, including to our own economy. The United States, together with the United Nations, exhausted every means at our disposal to bring this crisis to a peaceful end. However, Saddam clearly felt that by stalling and threatening and defying the United Nations, he could weaken the forces arrayed against him. While the world waited, Saddam Hussein met every overture of peace with open contempt. While the world prayed for peace, Saddam prepared for war. I had hoped that when the United States Congress, in historic debate, took its resolute action, Saddam would realize he could not prevail and would move out of Kuwait in accord with the United Nations resolutions. He did not do that. Instead, he remained intransigent, certain that time was on his side. Saddam was warned over and over again to comply with the will of the United Nations, leave Kuwait or be driven out. Saddam has arrogantly rejected all warnings. Instead, he tried to make this a dispute between Iraq and the United States of America. Well, he failed. Tonight, 28 nations, countries from five continents, Europe and Asia, Africa and the Arab League, have forces in the Gulf area standing shoulder to shoulder against Saddam Hussein. These countries had hoped the use of force could be avoided. Regrettably, we now believe that only force will make him leave. Prior to ordering our forces into battle, I instructed our military commanders 
to take every necessary step to prevail as quickly as possible and with the greatest degree of protection possible for American and allied servicemen and women. I've told the American people before that this will not be another Vietnam. And I repeat this here tonight. Our troops will have the best possible support in the entire world and they will not be asked to fight with one hand tied behind their back. I'm hopeful that this fighting will not go on for long and that casualties will be held to an absolute minimum. This is an historic moment. We have in this past year made great progress in ending the long era of conflict and cold war. We have before us the opportunity to forge for ourselves and for future generations a new world order, a world where the rule of law, not the law of the jungle, governs the conduct of nations. When we are successful, and we will be, we have a real chance at this new world order, an order in which a credible United Nations can use its peacekeeping role to fulfill the promise and vision of the UN's founders. We have no argument with the people of Iraq. Indeed, for the innocents caught in this conflict, I pray for their safety. Our goal is not the conquest of Iraq. It is the liberation of Kuwait. It is my hope that somehow the Iraqi people can, even now, convince their dictator that he must lay down his arms, leave Kuwait, and let Iraq itself rejoin the family of peace-loving nations. Thomas Paine wrote many years ago, these are the times that try men's souls. Those well-known words are so very true today. But even as planes of the multinational forces attack, attack Iraq, I prefer to think of peace, not war. I am convinced not only that we will prevail, but that out of the horror of combat will come the recognition that no nation can stand against a world united. No nation will be permitted to brutally assault its neighbor. No president can easily commit our sons and daughters to war. They are the nation's finest. Ours is an all-volunteer force, magnificently trained, highly motivated. The troops know why they're there. And listen to what they say they've said it better than any president or prime minister ever could. Listen to Hollywood Huddleston, Marine Lance Corporal. He says, let's free these people so we can go home and be free again. And he's right. The terrible crimes and tortures committed by Saddam's henchmen against the innocent people of Kuwait are an affront to mankind and a challenge to the freedom of all. Listen to one of our great officers out there, Marine Lieutenant General Walter Boomer. He said, there are things worth fighting for. A world in which brutality and lawness or lawlessness are allowed to go unchecked isn't the kind of world we're going to want to live in. Listen to Master Sergeant J.P. Kendall of the 82nd Airborne. We're here for more than just the price of a gallon of gas. What we're doing is going to chart the future of the world for the next hundred years. It's better to deal with this guy now than five years from now. And finally, we should all sit up and listen to Jackie Jones, an army lieutenant, when she says, if we let him get away with this, who knows what's going to be next? I've called upon Hollywood and Walter and JP and Jackie and all their courageous comrades in arms to do what must be done. Tonight, America and the world are deeply, deeply grateful to them and to their families. And let me say to everyone listening or watching tonight, when the troops we've sent in finish their work, 
I'm determined to bring them home as soon as possible. Tonight, as our forces fight, they and their families are in our prayers. May God bless each and every one of them and the coalition forces at our side in the Gulf, and may he continue to bless our nation, the United States of America. From the Oval Office, President Bush, a report on what's going on in the air war in the Persian Gulf. He declared it a historic moment. He said the battle was started by Saddam Hussein on August 2nd, and he said that uh, it's now been joined. Joining me at the White House is correspondent Wyatt Andrews. Wyatt, the speech was long on generalities and short on specifics. The, one, the, the few specifics that we, <clears throat> that we did hear, Rob, was that, uh, as everyone expected, this is now an air war. The president specifically said that ground forces had not uh, been joined. What progress report the president gave was, and these are important points, that the United States at this moment is targeting Saddam's arsenal, that is, his tanks, his nuclear weapons capability, and his chemical weapons arsenal. He said uh, that his only report from the commander in field, General Schwarzkopf, was that things are working according to plan. So those are the only operational details uh, that we got from the president tonight. As far as the generalities, as you point out, Rob, this was the president's, uh, in effect, justification speech to the nation. The, the, uh, his address uh, in which he sought to um, justify the employment of this massive strike force that is going on as we speak tonight. He pointed to what he called the endless diplomacy that the Secretary of State, that the Arab communities and two UN missions hadn't produced very much. Uh, and he laid, uh, he went straight to the argument that sanctions, in his point of view, would not work, that he had to resort to this level of force. And finally, Rob, he uh, several times uh, promised the Americans in this speech, and this will prove to be critical over the uh, time coming up, that the casualties will be few and that the United States won't fail. We Rob. will get more details, I suspect, in a few minutes, in about 15 minutes, from the Pentagon when uh, Dick Cheney, the Secretary of Defense, and Colin Powell uh, uh, deliver a briefing from the, uh, from the Pentagon. With continuing coverage of the Persian Gulf War, for White House correspondent Wyatt Andrews, I'm Rob Armstrong, CBS News, Washington. This is CBS News continuing coverage of the outbreak of hostilities in the Persian Gulf. Let's pause 10 seconds to allow our stations on the network to identify themselves. This is CBS News. All news, all the time. News Radio 95, WWJ, Detroit. This is CBS News continuing coverage of the outbreak of hostilities in the Persian Gulf. I'm Frank Setipani in New York, along with CBS News correspondent Doug Poling and military analyst Ben Works. Uh, just to summarize, for those of you who may have joined us in midstream, President Bush has just addressed the nation, announcing that the attacks against Iraqi forces uh, both in Iraq and in Kuwait were continuing even as he spoke. The attacks began a little more than two hours ago, shortly uh, before the 7 p.m. Washington time. The president stressed that ground forces were not engaged, and he said that uh, the U.S. troops would be going after chemical and nuclear facilities, as well as Saddam Hussein's tanks and artillery. Uh, even as the president spoke, there was a demonstration taking place outside the White House. <laughs> estimated in the thousands. We don't have an exact count in front of the White House. Uh, Anti-war protesters uh, uh, upset by the president's decision to attack Iraq. Standing by in Washington, uh, along with Doug Poling and Ben Works in New York, we have Rob Armstrong and Wyatt Andrews. Uh, question first for Rob and uh, for Wyatt both. Uh, either one of you pick up anything out of the ordinary, anything unexpected in the, the president's remarks. I did not. I think it was very much a restatement of the president's goals. Uh, as uh, Wyatt pointed out a short while ago, uh, he did, he was specific about what was going to happen as far as targets right now. He said very specifically the, the goal is to destroy Saddam Hussein's tanks, to destroy his nuclear capability, his chemical and biological capabilities. Uh, but by and large, I, I thought the speech was in many ways reassuring. It was designed uh, to, to reassure the American people. Wyatt, your assessment? I found uh, most striking in, in the surprising category the, the fact that the president would take as much time as he did addressing the potential Arab uh, population that might be out there listening, especially in Iraq. He appealed directly to the Iraqis to, if they have the chance and Saddam isn't uh, to, to be blunt killed in this first wave, that they should perhaps take matters in their own hands. 
he appealed to the Iraqis, uh, uh, telling them point blank that the United States does not seek the territorial conquest of their country, and in fact, fact, would invite them at the end of all this to rejoin the community of nations. You will find, as the dust settles, that statements like that are very, very important so that uh, Saddam, uh, so that just in case the United States might win the war and lose the peace, it's very important that the United States stress from the beginning. And I found it surprising that the president started this early to address the uh, Arab concerns about what we are up to. Several concerns were voiced today, though, Wyatt, uh, especially on Capitol Hill, that what might happen is, in fact, that we win the military side, but then Saddam Hussein gets to declare victory and, in fact, appears to be a victor uh, in, uh, in the eyes of the Arab world when all of this is over. Yes. And it's also uh, important to note that uh, Mr. Bush, who has been often accused of not uh, having any vision, laid out so much of what he saw as the vision. He is asking Americans to go in harm's way, to put their lives on the line, for a future world in which, as he put it tonight, no nation should be allowed to stand against the world. Uh, again, uh, as, as many commentators have pointed out, this is not the kind of war uh, being launched where uh, a gun is at the temple of the United States. This is a, a concept war, a war that we are fighting for intellectual principles uh, in which Mr. Bush is trying to push the notion that this dictator must be stopped now rather than later. And tonight, uh, in this speech, he made that case as eloquently as he ever has some reaction beginning to come in. House Speaker Thomas Foley issued a written statement. He has not appeared before cameras or microphones. He said uh, in his statement, we must now pray for a conflict that ends quickly, decisively, and with a minimum loss of life. Uh, the Speaker said we must now stand united in support of our armed forces in the Gulf who have uh, embraced the duty and burden of conducting the war. The Speaker was called by the President at about 5.30, we are told, by the Speaker's office and was asked to call the President back on a secure line, which he did, and the President then told the Speaker what was going on. We are expecting reaction from the, uh, the House and Senate galleries, and we are, of course, awaiting uh, Dick Cheney and General Colin Powell in the uh, Pentagon briefing room, that in about 10 minutes. Wyatt, going back to what's going on at the White House outside, uh, there were, in fact, demonstrations going on. You counted about how many people, did you think? Well, Rob, it was from my vantage point, which is near the, the West Wing. I'm not sure that there were thousands of demonstrators. There certainly have been uh, throughout the course of the day. But uh, rain, a heavy rainfall happened as reports of and confirmation uh, of war breaking out uh, reached the grounds, and, and I would estimate that crowd at something less than uh, two or three hundred. Wyatt but, Andrews, if I can interrupt for please. just a second. This is Doug Poling in New York. Yes, Doug. I just wanted to go back for a moment to what you were saying about the president and mm -hmm. about uh, some of the comments that, that he had made. I noticed one of the things that he said over and over again is he stressed the atrocities and the brutality and the unspeakable uh, uh, atrocities, I think he was the term he used, committed against the Kuwaitis. And uh, over and over again, we've heard him talk a lot about Kuwait, and he said, he reiterated, this is not about oil. And I wonder, there have been so many protests, and they seem to be growing, not necessarily tonight in Washington, but in the last few days around the country here in New York and San Francisco and in the Midwest and, and elsewhere. And the president is going back to this theme. Uh, so many people do think that this whole thing is about oil, and they point out the fact that um, other small countries have been invaded. Uh, uh, look at what happened in Cambodia, for example. We did nothing. And uh, we wonder, you know, uh, is it... Uh, the president seems to be saying, and a lot of people are very skeptical, but he seems to be saying that um, the, the people of Kuwait Oh, the main reason we're we're in this is that the uh, theme that you think he's taking that that, that he must uh, uh, he must make it clear that we're um, that we're on the side of the little guy in this. First of all, Doug, I don't think there's a, a single doubt in any American's mind that that this war, at least in part, is about oil. It is why the very reason that the United States has quote unquote a vital interest in that reason and has been so declared, uh, going back to the presidency of of Jimmy Carter. Uh, with that, though, you're also correct, I believe, in pointing out that uh, war, uh, oil uh, isn't simply it, that oil by itself would not be enough. And I think that is what the president was trying to uh, address, that night, address tonight, that this fight uh, is about standing up to a dictator who has, uh, who has used every weapon that he can get his hands on and who is trying to get his hands on every weapon he can, first point one. And point two, again, going back to uh, Mr. Bush's vision of this new world order, he believes that if this dictator is stopped, others won't rise to power. Uh, why this?
have been fired on Saudi Arabia. The French embassy in Riyadh confirms that at least one Scud missile was fired. Uh, this would seem to be the first reliable report along those lines. Uh, we also have word from Israeli radio that American stealth bombers were in action tonight in Iraq. Uh, this is Israeli radio. U.S. Air Force bombers have attacked Iraq's H-2 and H-3 air bases near the Jordanian border where surface-to-surface -surface missiles are stationed. The officials indicated that the Iraqi missile bases were the first targets of the airstrike. American stealth bombers, which are impossible to detect on radar, carried out the raid. The American officials also said the airstrike is going as planned and no American casualties have been reported. And uh, let's now go back to Washington to uh, Wyatt Andrews and uh, Rob... Ar Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I know you all heard the speech a short time ago by the president... <clears throat> And while there is not a great deal we can add now, uh, we did want to be as forthcoming as we can with you. At 7 o'clock tonight, as you all know by now, uh, Eastern Time, 3 o'clock Thursday morning in the Gulf, the armed forces of the United States began an operation at the direction of the president to force Saddam Hussein to withdraw his troops from Kuwait and to end his occupation of that country. At the direction of the president, I signed the execute order yesterday afternoon to undertake this operation, subject to certain conditions. It was to begin only after we'd met the terms of the resolution passed last Saturday by the Congress. Those conditions have been complied with and proper notice has been given as required. And the operation was not to take place if there had been any last minute diplomatic breakthroughs. The operation underway tonight taking place in the pre-dawn darkness of the Persian Gulf involves allied air forces of four nations, the United States, the United Kingdom, Saudi Arabia, and Kuwait. As they undertake their missions, they do so after months of careful planning. At the direction of the President, great care has been taken to focus on military targets, to minimize U.S. casualties, and to do everything possible to avoid injury to civilians in Iraq and Kuwait. The targets being struck tonight are located throughout Iraq and Kuwait. Our focus is on the destruction of Saddam Hussein's offensive military capabilities, the very capabilities that he used to seize control of Kuwait and that make him a continuing threat to the nations of the Middle East. These are the same capabilities that now threaten American and allied forces in the Gulf. Our goal, the same one we have maintained throughout Operation Desert Shield, is to liberate Kuwait and enforce the resolutions of the UN Security Council. This portion of the campaign directed against Saddam Hussein's offensive military force is an enormously complex undertaking. It involves all of the services of the United States military and hundreds of US and allied aircraft. It is an ongoing operation and we must therefore limit the kind and the amount of information that we provide in these early stages. This obviously is different from what happened in Panama in December of 1989, where most of the operation was over by the morning of the first day. We understand your need for information about what will happen next, and we are well aware of our obligation to keep the American people informed. But you must also understand that we cannot talk about future operations without putting at risk the safety of those who will have to carry them out. I believe I can speak for all of us at the Pentagon tonight when I say that we had hoped to settle this matter peacefully. This has clearly been an agonizing decision for the President and the Congress of the United States. And we've reached the point of committing our forces to battle very reluctantly, only after the most careful consideration. But no one should doubt our ability and our resolve to carry out our mission and to achieve our objective. I have great confidence in the professionalism, the dedication, and the determination of the men and women of our armed forces. They are, without question, the finest young sailors, soldiers, airmen, and Marines this nation has ever sent in harm's way. I want to assure all Americans that we will do our very best to carry out the President's orders as quickly and efficiently as possible and at the lowest cost possible. We'd be happy to respond to a few questions. General Powell, can you describe uh, the Iraqi Air Force's resistance, if any, their losses so far, and to what extent do you think that you've already achieved uh, air superiority now? Well, the operation's only uh, two and a half hours old, so I'm not quite prepared to take on your second this question. So far, Powell, there's been no the air staff. Any, any casualties so far? We uh, uh, will, at the appropriate time, be... Uh, uh, releasing information on casualties. Uh, we're not prepared to release any specifics now. I will simply say that uh, 
the preliminary reports we have received uh, in terms of the success of the operation, and that includes uh, the possibility of casualties, have been very, very encouraging. The operation appears to have gone uh, very well. Has there been any Iraq response of any kind? missiles that have been reportedly launched by Iraq? Uh, there have been a number of reports of Scud missiles, but uh, insofar as I am aware, they basically are false reports. General Powell, I want to say that. Can down on the types of aircrafts and numbers that were involved in the, uh, the raids? I really can't at this time because it is an ongoing operation. Uh, let me just say that it involved uh, the Air Forces uh, mentioned by Secretary Cheney and uh, sorties in the hundreds. Would you tell us anything else? Were there cruise missiles involved with that? Uh, I won't comment on specific weaponry. It's yeah, an ongoing well, operation. Are we targets were we bombing near Baghdad, and are we have we bombed any facilities where we think Saddam Hussein might be? We have not been uh, targeting Mr. Saddam Hussein. The purpose of our bombing facilities in the area of Baghdad is essentially to go after the command and control system of the Iraqi armed forces, and we're looking at principally military targets, command and control installations. Uh, air defense uh, sites that could uh, put our planes at risk, but they are militarily oriented targets. Have you any Iraq response of any kind? Um, the response of uh, the Iraqi forces at this point has been limited, I think would be the best way to characterize it. But again, let me emphasize, as General Powell did, we are in the very early stages of this operation. Uh, it is likely to run for a long period of time. Uh, I realize you've all got legitimate questions about it, but there simply are things we do not know yet uh, because it is an ongoing operation, because uh, pilots are just now returning, and there will be a lot of work uh, required to assess the success of the, uh, the initial efforts, and there will be a lot of follow-up work required as well. Could you tell us, please, uh, whether or not there have been any indications whatsoever that the Iraqi troops, the 540,000 Iraqi troops in the Kuwaiti theater, have been cut off from their command and control headquarters in Baghdad? Uh, I wouldn't want to speculate on that at this point, Wolf. Well, uh, Mr. Secretary, can I follow up, please? Sure. Can I follow up? The President said this was strictly an air operation for the time being. When does the uh, U.S. decide to send in the ground forces? It is strictly an air operation for the time being, and I wouldn't want to speculate on the point at which uh, additional forces might be engaged. Have you talked to Senator? Did any Navy planes? Senator McNeil, Larry Newsard, this evening. So we are, quote, now prisoners of our own war. Is that true? Uh, yes, we are. Is that true? Uh, yes, we are. Is that true? 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 Yes, were any things that have our targets uh, thus far included tanks and artillery? I don't want to get into specific target sets yet. Uh, as, as the information uh, comes in and builds over time, and we can give it to you historically, we will give it out, but I'm not prepared to go into specific target sets and what have what targets have been hit and have not, because it really is just too early to give you that kind of bomb damage assessment. Saddam Hussein says tomorrow, I give up, I'm sorry, I will withdraw from Kuwait. Will you pause in your, to have a pause in your air campaign, or will you continue with it until you not out all the priority targets? I will, I will do whatever the President of the United States directs us to do through the Secretary of Defense. General Secretary, from a military perspective, what went into your thinking in deciding to launch the attack at this point? Point this evening. What, what were the factors? Well, I think the, there were several factors. Uh, uh, of course, the president made the basic decision uh, to commit the force. Uh, it was affected by, among other things, the expiration of the United Nations deadline that had been set uh, on November 30th when the Security Council voted uh, for the uh, use of any means necessary to get him out. Uh, I think it was uh, affected in part uh, as a result of consultation with our allies, uh, but it also was based upon uh, the uh, advice of uh, our senior military commanders uh, in terms of picking a time when uh, conditions appeared to be most favorable for undertaking the operation. Let me emphasize, though, that the, the procedure we went through was to plan for execution of... Uh, the operation at a point after the expiration of the United Nations deadline, um, but I had no authority to execute the plan until the President instructed me yesterday afternoon to do so, and it was at that point that we signed out the execute order with the qualifiers I mentioned in my opening statement. Those favorable factors, can you tell us what some of those were? Um, I think I just leave it uh, 
leave it there. There was no response, or a, a very small response from the Iraqi forces at this point? Uh, again, I'm, I'm reluctant uh, to characterize uh, the response beyond what we've already said about it. We've not had an opportunity to de debrief our pilots yet. Uh, some of them are still flying missions. And uh, I think it would be inappropriate at this point to, to convey the notion that somehow we've got a final fix on it. But I think it would be fair to say, and General Powell uh, may well want to comment on this, that the initial reaction from the Iraqis uh, is such that uh, I'm generally of the opinion that we achieved a fairly high degree of tactical surprise. On the part of Iraq. None to, uh, to my knowledge. Mr. Secretary, could, could you tell us, uh, the President mentioned uh, oh, no, 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 no. that uh, one of the objectives was to take out chemical and nuclear sites. Can you tell us in a general way if that a mission was accomplished? Uh, I can say that we have, in fact, uh, gone after those targets. Uh, I do not yet have information on... Uh, uh, the effectiveness of those efforts. Mr. Secretary, what about word of casualties at Baghdad? You indicated you wanted to spare uh, civilians there. Do you have any sense about how that may or may not have occurred in the city? There was a lot of bombing, obviously, in Baghdad. The, the best reporting that I've seen on uh, what transpired in Baghdad was on CNN. <laughs> and, uh, it uh, uh, would appear, based upon the comments that were coming in from uh, the CNN crew in the hotel in Baghdad that uh, the operation was successful in striking targets uh, with a high degree of precision. At least that's the reporting according to CNN. Was there, was there an Iraqi attempt to launch uh, missiles? Uh, We've had uh, re reports of missile launches, but none of them have been confirmed. Well, what, about the, uh, what about the scuds in uh, western Iraq at those uh, air bases on the border? Have you got any reading on that? Are those fairly high priority targets? Yes, they are fairly high priority targets. And how'd you do? <laughs> I'm I'm not prepared to say uh, how we did or what we've done. So I'll follow up. I'll follow up on that. So at the end of this operation, this phase of the operation, when you get a